asked her, uh, are you sure? Okay, you want it on CapEx planning or capture planning? She said, no, it is capture planning. So then I was looking at it. Now, very recently, I took uh, uh, kind of the role of uh, business development and strategy. So I found that uh, there is a lot of relevance between uh, okay, proposal development, business development, capture planning, and uh, there's a lot of uh, okay, body of knowledge and practices around this area. And also I found that it is very, very relevant to project program managers and other decision makers uh, okay, to invest their scarce resources on building uh, quality bits and proposals. So my little research revealed that uh, uh, Krishna Kumar is one of the uh, specialists and an SME in that area. So then I corresponded with him, understood a little more about the APMP and other stuff. So then I thought I will, okay, we will propose a special webinar for the, our participants and other guests. So that's the little story behind the, this webinar. Uh, some of you are uh, uh, guests to this uh, webinar, new visitors. So I'll, I'll just give, take a uh, freedom to uh, give a little bit about uh, Provinces. So Provinces is uh, a 15 year old, old organization. You can see this roadmap uh, in our website. Uh, we call ourselves uh, as a kind of a 360 degree partner in PPM space, portfolio, program, and project management space, working in terms of uh, people development, process development, and consulting, and then on digital transformation in terms of bringing state-of-art solutions and uh, other suite of uh, applications to implement uh, portfolio, program, and project management. So to provide uh, some of the best of the services in this area. We partner with a uh, few leading organizations in this field in terms of uh, PMI uh, as a premium ATP partner, and then Microsoft as a gold partner on PPM competency, and uh, some of the very niche special areas like uh, critical change scheduling, and uh, LOB and ERP integrations with uh, enterprise project management, risk management, lean construction and infrastructure, and project management for NGOs and not for profits. So these are some of the very leading companies across the world okay, with whom we work to bring the best solutions to our customers. And uh, so this is some of our uh, uh, clients that we earned over the last uh, one and a half decade. So coming to this specific uh, program, uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, uh, Krishna Kumar, okay, he's called uh, popularly as KK. So he's a veteran with 30 plus years of experience uh, globally, worked in big uh, world-class organizations like IBM, PwC, Siemens, et cetera. So currently he is heading uh, uh, this company, uh, Mind IT, as a CEO and founder, which basically specializes in bid and proposal management. And uh, to uh, kind of uh, complement this, uh, uh, he is a certified practitioner through uh, APMP, Association of uh, Proposal Management Professionals. And they have uh, three levels of uh, certification in this body of knowledge, foundation, practitioner, and uh, the further uh, areas of specialization. So I'm very happy uh, to introduce uh, KK uh, to this audience. And uh, over to you, KK. And we will leave uh, say about uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, for to learn more about uh, APMP, these certifications. And uh, I'm sure 
I myself have a lot of questions on this area. So many more will have it. Uh, and we have audience, uh, both uh, uh, international and national, across uh, various uh, bandwidth of organizations and uh, profiles. So without wasting time, I will pass it on to KK. Uh, before that, uh, any guidelines, uh, Ratna, in terms of Q&A feedback and other things? Maybe you can no. just uh, share with that. Uh, no, so we'll, we'll share that before the Q&A. Uh, yes, Prashant? We'll share it before the Q&A. Okay, all right. Okay. So then uh, over to uh, KK. You can share uh, your uh, system. I'll stop sharing mine. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Srinivasan. Um, and, and thank you, Srinivasan, for this opportunity. Uh, to interact uh, with the community of uh, project managers, program managers, and portfolio managers. And I'll um, try and make this session um, as relevant as possible without trying to make it too theoretical or too much of a, a lecturing type uh, mode, uh, because th that's something which I always struggle when I'm on the other side of the table listening to many webinars. So I'll try and make that as rele relevant as possible. So good evening, um, everyone. Um, uh, I hope you have had a good week. We are coming to the end of the week and hope everybody is keeping safe, especially with the pandemic still uh, going around, I suppose. Uh, we still don't know when it's going to get over, hopefully soon enough. Right. Um, just wanted to share some uh, commonalities between um, my topic today and the role of project management. I'm going to use project management as, as probably the base to um, sort of compare and contrast between the world of project management and the world of catch-up planning, um, many a times also called as uh, business development, many a times also called as pre-sales. So there are a whole lot of terms which typically gets used uh, and very loosely so. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and cover that. Um, the thing is that bulk of my career has been as a project manager, um, uh, of course, predominantly in the IT industry. And um, uh, having uh, gone through many projects, uh, I can tell you one thing that all uh, I, I look at three parameters when it comes to project management. Are you delivering the co project on cost? Are you delivering the project on time? And are you delivering the project on quality? And um, I'm kind of proud to say that out of those three parameters, I've more or less consistently failed on two parameters, which is cost and time. But one thing which I've always uh, focused a great deal on is the quality. And, and one of the biggest representations for quality on projects for me, and when I'm talking about the projects, I'm talking about IT projects here, has been that every one of my projects have been completely successful in the sense that it got deployed into the client environment, end users have been using it sometimes many years, sometimes even decades. And that's something which I'm very proud of. I'm not particularly proud of the fact that um, practically all of my projects didn't get delivered on cost and time. Of course, there are a whole lot of reasons behind it. But I can tell you one thing that um, time and again, um, the single biggest blame that gets hoisted upon is uh, a function outside of the project management, outside of the delivery organization, which is typically sales. Sales and within sales, the whole function of capture planning, pre-sales and all of those. And this is where I just wanted to bring about the whole concept of what I call as the making of the promise and the delivering of the promise. So one thing which, um, whether, some of, whether you've realized it or not, that when it comes to uh, B2B, businesses, uh, predominantly as an organization which is providing a set of services uh, to a client, um, there are really two portions of the business. You win the business and you execute the business, right? So what I call is win the business is making of the promise. So you will notice that in complicated B2B transactions, whether it's a large, large IT project, it's a large uh, engineering infrastructure type project, it could be 
uh, maybe something around healthcare, for example, you know, a whole lot of projects do, that do get executed and delivered uh, successfully or otherwise, a lot of these starts from what I call as a making of the promise, which is when sales interacts uh, with your clients and starts to sort of build the contours of what the client is trying to solve as a set of problems, what are the kind of benefits that the client is uh, looking for? And in the process, walking with them in the journey of what exactly they need to purchase or procure or commission, whatever that project is. And, and that entire journey can get, can get fairly complicated, complicated because of two factors. One, time. Two, the fact that there are multiple stakeholders involved in the client organization. So inherently, the making of the promise by nature is complicated. And this is where things tend to go wrong or things can go wrong much later um, in the future when the promise has already been made, reflected in a contract. And subsequently, when it comes to the delivering of the promise, uh, promise through people like you who are the project managers, portfolio managers, program managers, you find that the, the promises that were made were either too tall or overpromised or beyond reach and whatnot, right? And time and again, we have been complaining about this, saying, oh, sales did a bad job. They promised something which we cannot execute. Um, and of course, sales will have its own story saying, oh, you know, the project organization could not deliver. You know, they were incapable. They got it all wrong. They are too conservative. God knows. All kinds of reasons get thrown um, across the wall. So given the, the fact that this is, this is the world that we are living in, I also see that there is a significant shift that's happening uh, across the board in the sense that um, uh, companies are realizing that we can no longer afford to kind of de-alienate the making of the promise and the delivering of the promise. And companies have realized that the cost of not fulfilling those promises or even setting the prom wrong promises in the first place is too huge, too huge in terms of loss profitability, significant risks added on, and, and risk is something that you guys understand so well, and we're still reputation out there in the market. So organizations have realized that how closely can we align the whole world of making of the promise and the delivering of the promise. And this is where the whole concept of capture planning, whole concept of pre-sales, business development started coming into play. And initially, I think, um, at least if I go back to the many days where I used to participate in proposals, it largely used to be very reactive kind of function. So sales will bring an opportunity to the table and say, hey, you know, guys, this is what a client is wanting. How can we solve this problem for them? You know, is there a solution that we can put together at a price and, and um, put together some kind of a hash of a proposal and submit it to the client? And hopefully in that, you know, client finds some meaning, finds a good story and likes what you have to offer and goes ahead and signs up the contract, which is when the start of all troubles uh, happen. So this entire area of capture planning, and, and I'm going to use this term capture plan planning, pre-sales, business development, uh, broadly to mean the same. Okay, So if I keep switching these terms, please uh, consider it as synonymous to uh, capture planning. So people realized, or ra rather organizations realized, that um, we cannot any longer have this function staffed with, from very support, very reactive kind of um, mindset. We will have to put in good people, the best and the brightest from the organization, who can then participate effectively in, the, in, in this entire opportunity cycle. Uh, let me also talk a little bit about opportunity cycle, that when we talk about opportunity cycle, typically in the overall sales process, um, there are really two broad steps in the opportunity cycle. First is what I call as a creating of the opportunity, which is largely done by marketing and sales. Uh, so fundamentally, you reach a stage where the client says, you know what, I have certain pains or gains that I want to, uh, certain pains to be solved and I certain gains that I would like to achieve. and very importantly, I have a budget. So the definition of an opportunity is these two parameters. The client has some pain or gain that he is looking for, and he has a budget. 
you have reached a stage, then the opportunity has got created in the client's mind, right? Now, the second stage is in terms of developing or nurturing this opportunity, which is where the whole function of capture planning starts coming into play. Because now this is the time when you can uh, either engage with the client in, in, a, in a series of conversations, if that's the path that the client has chosen, or through very formal means where the client might float what's called as an RFP. RFP standing for Request for Proposal, also called as Tenders. In which case, the client is, of course, taking a slightly formal move. But all of this is where the uh, uh, creation of the opportunity and the nurturing of the opportunity happen. But all this broadly fits into the making of the promise bucket. So hopefully that kind of hierarchy is, is reasonably clear. Now, if you go through the underlying tenets of what happens in project management to what happens in this area called pre-sales, capture planning, business development, there are some of the broad tenets that apply to project portfolio program management equally and in fact very well apply in this area. For example, planning. For example, strategizing. For example, resource management. Um, for example, cost management. Um, um, what else? The other aspects of cost and quality, which is the, the uh, three pillars of all project management, equally apply to this. So in that sense, people who come with a strong project management background have now got a tremendous opportunity to not only enhance their skills, but can even make potentially significant career transitions and career changes as well. Now, uh, uh, at least during my project management days, I used to have a certain aversion towards sales. I said, you know, I know sales are sales people just over promise. Uh, all that they do is wine and dine and they leave that entire dirty work to be handled by me. And here I am, poor project manager, trying to execute this so complicated project. Um, my management expects me to deliver it on cost time quality. You know, the usual sort of complaints that we keep going in. Um, so here's an opportunity to change that. How? By participating in the making of the promise. And that's something which I just wanted to share with you as a background context in which I see a tremendous opportunity for people who are um, uh, in different stages. Some of you may be saying, hey, this is this is uh, tickled my curiosity. Some of you are saying, you know what? Hey, I'm really tired of this. I want to change. And uh, you don't want to be in core sales but you still want to be part of the broader sales function, then capture planning um, or pre-sales or business development. All of these are equally fantastic opportunities where you don't necessarily lose out on the powers helping your organization win more business. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity for people um, who are willing to sort of look beyond your, uh, uh, let's say, traditional role of being a project. And that I think is, is, is fantastic. A couple of other added bonuses that you, that you do get is that uh, project management, typically speaking, is a relatively black and white world. And, and what I mean by relatively black and white world is your starting point is more likely to be a contract or an SOW, which, which kind of tells you, hey, what the project is all about, what is it that you'd expect it to deliver. The client has a reasonable idea of what the project is all about. To that extent, it's a relatively black, uh, black and white world. Of course, there are still shades of gray. I recognize that. But compare this to what you have to do in capture planning, and it's a, a significant degree of grayness uh, prevailing there. So that's one of the challenges a lot of project portfolio managers tend to kind of say, hey, you know, I don't like it, or, or, or I think I'm going to struggle with it and all of those. Uh, while there is going to be a level of struggle, but it's also a lot of fun. It's also a lot of fun because it allows you to uh, bring out some of the creative elements of uh, yourself into that entire process of putting together the best response as far as the client is concerned. Um, the other big thing that you also likely to see between the world of project management and getting into capture planning is that um, uh, uh, lack of information. Okay, um, Whereas in the project management world, uh, even if you lack information, chances are high that you can still talk to some client stakeholder, get additional information, and still go about executing some of those projects. You may not get those opportunities when it comes to capture planning or, or the world appraisals and all of those. So in such a case, 
you have to start making certain assumptions, uh, educated guesses, um, uh, do some background research to say, hey, what is the client trying to solve here? Let me look at who are the client's competitors and what are they doing about some of the issues that the client is pointing out. Maybe talking to some people who are in the client's industry, for example, a whole lot of um, possibilities are available. It's how much you want to spend time and effort and, and, and maybe even money to go about taking that information. And if you find that exciting, then you will thoroughly enjoy the role that comes broadly under the capture planning umbrella. And these are some of the things which, um, uh, let me put it this way, that I was quite, ex quite excited about having done enough projects and cursed enough salespeople. I realized that, hang on a second, you know, I'm very conveniently sitting and accusing people on this side of the table. I need to step out and go on to the other side of the table and feel the world for them. And, and trust me, when I went there, it just opened up a whole new bunch of uh, thoughts and my own mind uh, removed a whole lot of biases that I, that I carried. And, and I must say that it's been a, a tremendous journey, um, fantastic in, in every respect, because it has kind of played to my strengths. And yet it does not necessarily mean that I have to be out of character. OK, so I'll, I'll just give you a simple thing. I'm, I'm not like that born sales guy out there. OK, and like many of you, I did have a certain um, how do I say I, I wanted to keep sales at arm's length. Let me put it this way. So I'm not a sales guy. I don't think I'll ever be a sales guy. But what it has allowed me to do is that sales is one of the toughest jobs out there. And I take it up as a professional responsibility to make sure that when I'm working on those opportunities uh, with sales, I'm going to put my best foot forward. And if sales doesn't win, guess what? The rest of us who are part of the organization also don't win. And that's where I felt that, that I have a role to play. And from that moment, my attitude changed, moment my outlook changed. I think it's been a fantastic change. So I just wanted to put these set of... Um, uh, thoughts across to you um, from my own personal journey standpoint, um, whether it, you are able to relate, not able to relate, quite happy to hear any questions, um, you know, at the end of my session and all of those. But this is what I just uh, wanted to share as a little bit of a long background uh, context, and I hope you would have found this useful. Okay, let me go to the next stage. What I now want to do is um, kind of walk you through uh, a small portion of this overall capture planning, which is a little more touch and feel so that I don't give you a bunch of um, boring presentations and, and all of those, but walk you through something which is more real life, so to speak. <clears throat> this is where I'm going to share your screen. Somebody's already put a message on chat. Yes, uh, just hold on for 10 seconds and I'm going to soon, soon share my screen. So... Um, Shinivasan, can you confirm that you're able to see my screen? Yes, or can one of you confirm? Uh, yes, sir, we are able to see, but it's a PDF. Yes, it is a PDF. Yes. So yes. don't worry. I'm my boring PowerPoint presentation is going to come slightly later. Okay. So uh, yeah, it's this is uh, deliberate. So what I've attempted to do here is. Um, so people who are familiar with the world of RFPs, request for proposals, which is usually the starting point where clients are saying, hey, broadly, this is what we want to buy. Uh, this is the kind of requirements that we have. Da, 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 da. This is what we expect you to do and submit a proposal and all of those. I'm just taking this as a simple example to kind of illustrate this whole world and how you can uh, use your strong project management skills of analysis, planning, strategizing, all of those to uh, participate effectively in submitting what I call as world-class proposals in response to RFPs like this. Now, typically when you look at RFPs, the, the uh, RFPs by nature come with a certain set of characteristics. One, RF RFPs don't have a structure um, because really speaking, there, are, there is nothing like a standards body when it comes to producing RFPs. So all kinds of clients write all kinds of stuff. 
So some write too much detail, some write very little detail, some focus more on mere instructions for you, uh, some focus on uh, what are some of the business challenges, some focus on very narrow detail requirements. So RFPs come in a whole varieties of shapes and sizes and all of those. And clearly you have no control over the way the RFP has been put together. Having said that, the most consistent thing about all RFPs is they're extremely boring to me. I must have gone through hundreds and hundreds of RFPs, but I can tell you one thing for sure. The only consistent thing about all RFPs that are extremely bore, boring to read. And what do we do in return? In return, we submit an equally boring proposal. So we take revenge on our clients effectively. And that's, that's the way this world has been operated. So when it comes to RFP, it automatically therefore brings in a set of challenges, which is how do you make sense of an RFP? Given the wide variety of shapes and sizes and flavors of RFP, how do you make sense of it? So one of the things that we have put together is a methodology which helps us read RFPs and analyze it and make sense of it in a very structured manner, independent of size and complexity and all of those, such that the downstream steps then becomes more easier and consistent in being able to apply on every RFP. That's fundamentally what we do. So if you notice this particular RFP, and don't worry if you don't understand this RFP, it's actually a very short RFP. You don't have to worry about the details of the RFP, but uh, I just want to illustrate the principles so that you understand how this world typically operates. Some of you might even have participated in proposals, so in which case, hopefully, you'll be able to relate to this much better. So, what we do here is that when we get the RFP, obviously, the first thing that we do is read it. And as we read, what we want to do is we identify what are called as issues. And issues in this particular case of the RFP are what is uh, uh, highlighted in this turquoise blue. Uh, uh, shading, right? So some of these texts uh, can be highlighted because it's an issue. And exactly what is an issue? An issue is, put it very broadly, is uh, something of interest. It could be a high-level requirement. It could be some sort of a challenge. It could be some kind of background statement that the client is talking about. Um, uh, it could be some of the goals and outcomes that the client is trying to achieve. So anything of this nature becomes an issue of interest and we just want to highlight it. At this stage, what we want to do is not worry about exactly what we are going to do with the issue. Uh, uh, because those are things that are typically going to come at a later stage in, in our entire propose, uh, proposal development process. And uh, at this stage, just focus on merely identifying the issues. One of the challenges that the whole lot of um, uh, capture planning professionals or a bid and proposal professionals face is that when they're reading the RFP, there's a very strong temptation to start throwing your organization uh, sweet spot or capabilities or whatever, uh, because you, you get very excited with certain issues which are bang in your sweet spot. This is a very strong temptation that we attempt to keep it on the side. And that's why we have taken this approach. Quite proven very well. We have done this through many, many trainings, trained more than 1,000 people, worked with multiple clients with this methodology, and it has definitely worked out very, very well so far. So as you can see, as you read through the RFP, you keep identifying issues of interest, again, highlighted in blue. Um, and um, as you go through the RFP, you'll notice that a whole lot of issues get identified. And the question that comes up next is, Great, what do you do with these issues? So the next step that we follow is we organize it in what's called as a simple list for a moment. So if you see my column F, hopefully you can see my spreadsheet. Can you confirm one of you, just to be sure? Are you able to see my screen, Srinivasan? Can you confirm the spreadsheet is visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Perfect. Great. All right. So, um, as you can see, all the issues that we have identified from the RFP is listed here, as you can see in column F. And at this stage, all we are doing is copying the issue identified in the RFP and pasting it into a simple spreadsheet like this. Why do we want to do that? The first thing we want to ensure is that the language used by the client is exactly what we are going to capture as part of this issues list. Why do we want to do that? We want to make sure that 
whatever language or the phrase or the sentence that the client has used is something that we can use and reflect it back in our proposal. Why is this important? And let me share some uh, human behavior psychology, which, which is prevalent. Um, I'll just give you a simple experiment that you can try it out with anybody, you know, your spouse, your sp sibling, parents, colleagues, friends, it doesn't matter. The next time you're in a conversation with them, and when you're listening to them, see if you can pick up a few words or a pieces of sentences that they have used. And when you respond back, use those and bring it into the response that you give back to them. Okay. Just try this as an experiment. Chances are very high that the other person may, may even tell you that he or she felt that you listened to them very well. This is a very simple trick in human behavior psychology to demonstrate that you are building empathy, you're, uh, you're demonstrating the fact that you're listening to the client. And the same, the same principle applies in the world of business because at the end of the day, you have a bunch of human beings on the other side. That's exactly what we are attempting to do, but not through a verbal form, through a Written form. That's what the set of issues get uh, captured from the RFP as is. Once we have done that, we go ahead and group them. So these issues which got identified from the RFP, we go ahead and group them, give it some kind of a group name, and we can be creative about it. We can interpret it the way we want it. We can group them the way we like. All of those creative freedom is all available. And once we have done this, what next? What we have effectively done at this stage is to kind of mimic what the RFP is trying to do in our own way of doing it. That's fundamentally what we have done. And trying to be as truthful and as faithful to the RFP as we possibly can. Great. But is this all that, um, uh, that we have? And is this information good enough? Usually not. Why is that? Because what happens is that uh, within the client's organization, you have what's called as client intelligence. And what I mean by client intelligence is that, firstly, not all issues are the same. You know, some issues are more important, some issues are less important. Uh, in addition, not all issues may get reflected in the RFP. Some of them may, may be sort of uh, not explicitly stated. And usually what, what you ideally want to have is a very well-functioning sales who has built deep relationships with the clients and can provide you that intelligence, which is where we come to the next stage, as you can see in column G, is because not all issues are same, we work with sales typically uh, for lack of uh, not having um, the ability to interact with the client, let's say for a moment, which is typically the case with RFPs, is get sales to kind of give us some weightage on each one of these issues. So you want an, um, uh, high, uh, 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 most important issues as ranked five or a weightage of five, medium issues uh, weighted as three, and probably least important as one. Uh, one. Obviously, there is a level of subjectivity here. Nobody denies it. But you can use broad rules of thumbs with, with skills to say, hey, you know, we have identified 75 issues from this RFP. Can you tell us the top 10 to 15% of the issues that are of concern to the client? And once sales gives you that input, you can use that to classify your issues with these sort of weightage. Okay. So what we are attempting to do is bring in a level of, um, if I may say, science into something which is by nature very unscientific. And, and that's what we are attempting to do. Great. Let me stop here. And if, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and I'll, I'll try to address them once my session is over. But to quickly summarize, um, what we have done here is that, you know, point one, we have no control over how RFPs are written. Okay. Point two, therefore trying to make sense of those RFPs becomes extremely challenging. And what we are now trying to do is just merely identify issues from the RFP without bringing in our own biases. And that's exactly what we have done through column F. Once we have identified those issues, we will group them in through our own interpretation and group them as, as you can see in this example group them by whatever means possible and have lots of creative freedom there do that the next step that we do is um, if you can go back to the client and help them give us some idea of which issues are important failing which you can always go to sales because sales is likely to have that information 
hopefully they've done a great job uh, with the client with, with relationships and all of those that they can give some kind of a weightage on those issues right thus far all we have done is focus on the client try to build a level of understanding of the client from the eye and of course the intelligence that they have gathered uh, uh, through the sales function what next and this is where we go to the next stage of uh, the process of building proposals which is now we look at what are our organization capabilities and every organization that you work for always has a cap cap bunch of capabilities reflected through what you do or what you deliver how you do or how you deliver and your general organization track record so let's say for example if uh, you're a product uh, company let's say a software product company the what you deliver is your software product how you deliver is let's say you know you will engage with the client through professional services or project management or maybe you work with other partners like a systems integration company and things like that all this becomes how you deliver the uh, uh, product to the client and of course you know uh, the organization track record comes into play as to how long you have been in business how successful you have been are you profitable are you growing da 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 da, da which comes into play all of this represents a bunch of capabilities as far as your organization is concerned what we have attempted to do here through these columns h to uh, s is basically these are the capabilities that your organization is representing where can you find these capabilities through your websites through your brochures through the many powerpoint presentations that you make as part of sales pitches and all of those so one should be able to find out what your organization capabilities are um uh um uh, what, what this bunch of capabilities are and hopefully you can now put them in a bunch of columns like this what's the next step this is where we take every one of your uh, every one of the organization's capabilities and look at how it can offer some kind of a solution for the issues that we have identified so i'm i'm just going to take a simple example so uh, you know let's take Uh, this particular case and i'll just increase uh, uh, zoom or let me take this particular example team building right okay okay so i'll just increase zoom to show you basically this so one of the things that the client has talked about as an issue is that team building is very important for them and therefore they have given it a weightage of 5 okay this 5 mind you represents how important it is to the client now when it comes to your capability you can say the question to ask is does my capability offer a significant solution which will help me address this particular issue as far as the client is concerned in which case you want to score a 5 failing which you want to score 4 3 2 1 going down so as you can see in this uh, as you can see in this particular case uh, for this capability you believe you can but for this particular issue which is g32 or g22 um um uh, you have only medium capabilities which can help solve that uh, issues concern and and that that's perfectly all right because you can never have uh, all your capabilities being able to solve all the issues as far as a client is concerned 100% of the time that's the very nature of b2b complex businesses having done that then it's just a simple question of getting a weighted score of the client's weightage versus our raw score and you get a weighted score great so when we do such an exercise across issues and across our capabilities you are likely to see a spreadsheet like this you know all the yellow ochre represents high uh, solutioning capability matching that particular issue and and, and as you can see and many grosses up as scores um, as you can see in this particular row down below these now become your differentiators so the top 3 represented by these uh, green cells effectively become your top 3 differentiator what this means is that when it comes to this specific proposal you want to talk about more of these top capabilities the top 3 capabilities than anything else because that is what is likely to get stand out 
uh, as a differentiated uh, organization provider as compared to talking about all your capabilities under the sun, which is a cardinal mistake that many times we make when we uh, put together responses to clients. We want to throw everything under the sun in the proposal and say, you know, we can sing and dance and cook and clean and, and jump and <laughs> swim and all those sort of things, right? But only a certain set of capabilities are relevant as far as that client is concerned. So that's something that we need to be very careful about. But unfortunately, there hasn't been any scientific or, or reasonably scientific methodology which allows you to do that. And that's what we have attempted through this exercise. Hopefully, this has given you a sense of how you can go about building what I call as a win strategy. What we have done so far is basically build a win strategy in a very structured, methodical manner. One of the biggest shifts between project management to you being part of the capture planning function, and let's say you're a proposal manager or a bid manager or things of those nature, is your focus has to be entirely on winning the business. Whereas in that one, it's all about delivering the business. Here, it's all about winning the business. So um, all the others merely play a support role, you know, planning, strategizing, resource management, all of those play merely a supporting role to this entire attitude saying, hey, how do I win this opportunity? And that's that's fundamentally what we are attempting to do. Hopefully, this has given you a sense of it. Uh, if not, you know, uh, drop in your questions. I can kind of address specific questions or maybe even do a quick walkthrough again and all of this. At this stage, I'm just going to switch over and show you the final oh. product of uh, what uh, hey, final world plus. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, see, if the customer prescribes the selection criteria, uh, so then there is a basis for evaluation. Uh, if the customer doesn't mention on what basis uh, they are going to select, now how do we uh, understand sure. that? Sure. So even uh, where the selection criteria has been prescribed, you'd be very surprised, Srinivasan, that in most RFAs, the selection criteria that is specified is too broad level, too high level. And time and again, I have seen it that those selection criteria is very difficult to uh, sort of um, uh, use as a strategy to build your proposal. So many times I've seen, seen RFPs where client says, uh, you know, we will give 60% weightage to your uh, uh, technical proposal, we will give 30% uh, weightage to your commercial and 10% to your organization's track, uh, track record. This is so broad level that there is very little that you can do about it in terms of the way you address it. Unlike government RFPs, where government RFPs tend to go to a great level of detail in what the selection criteria and assign marks to each one of those, where things are a little more easier to adhere to those selection criteria. Coming back to your point about where the client has not specified selection criteria, what should you do? One of the simplest things that you can do is ask them, saying, hey, Mr. Client, you want us to respond to this, but can you tell us how you are going to evaluate us? Right? Mm -hmm. Now, here again, clients take very varying degrees of responses. Some may give you a very broad level uh, sort of uh, direction, like the, way I, like the example that I give you. Some actually remain very tight-lipped, saying, you know what? That's confidential. We are not going to share with you. And you just have to respect it and just move on. What that basically tells you is that there's a lot of subjectivity in the evaluation criteria. Okay. Ideally, ideally speaking, if your sales has had a good relationship with a client, you can sort of engineer the selection criteria. Okay. This way, you're planting it in the client's mind. Number one. Number two, you're also eliminating your competition. This is, this is quite well established in, in, in today's world, never for a publicly um, accepted or, 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 or talked about, but it's an open secret. But will it not be unethical? Well, the only way I can say, uh, Srinivasan, is that I'm sure you've heard of the statement that all is fair in love and war. I extend this to say all is fair in love, war, and bidding. That's what this is. Mm. Okay. Now, here again, uh, uh, it, it, it has to go back to what your organization ethics are. You know, some organizations are very, very, um, uh, <clears throat> very particular about how they want to play this game. Um, uh, some might go to 
other extremes, and I'm sure we have read, or read about many of these organizations in the newspapers um, and things. Well, I'm sure many of you would have heard the Beaufort story back in the 80s and how big it was and, and, and things of those nature. So, you know, those are all individual organization choices that you are making in terms of how you want to conduct business. But the point about influencing the client um, and telling them that, hey, these are good evaluation criteria that you should take into account is something that you can suggest by all means. Whether the client takes it on board is completely there. Also, don't forget that many times some of the larger clients uh, also appoint consultants who do this for them. Okay. Yes. So yeah. many a times the consultants set the evaluation criteria. They try to be as objective as possible and all of those. Now, if you have good relationships with these uh, um, uh, third-party consultants, I mean, even third-party consultants would be open to, uh, you know, evaluation criteria guidelines from you saying, hey, uh, Mr. Consultant, we think these are some of the evaluation uh, criteria that you should apply. Of course, leaving the choice entirely to them on which to take on board, which not to take on board. So you can push, you can push, you can push, you can push really hard. So those are choices that you have to make as an organization uh, in terms of how you want to be aggressive uh, pursuing this opportunity. Okay, thank you. So yeah, hopefully that's given you a broad perspective of uh, uh, the evaluation criteria and all of those. So here I'm kind of switching mode and, and trying to show you the end result, which is what I call as the proposal. And remember, I talked about making of the promise. The proposal is the making of the promise. This is the promise you're making to the client. And, and if, if let's say the client writes your proposal and he says, you know what, I want to sign this contract tomorrow. You should be prepared to do that. That's a level of detail, rigor, um, and, and uh, uh, conviction and commitment that you need to bring to this whole process. So as you can see, here is an example of a, what I call as a world-class proposal. Uh, right from the way, for example, you designed the cover page. So just to illustrate this, and I'm always very passionate about this, is that this was a kind of a proposal that we submitted to the United Nations uh, Climate Change Secretary, where if you notice, you will notice this hexagons, right? And uh, here you will notice that this looks like a beehive. So um, we brought in the whole concept of a beehive because the bees are so very fundamental to the climate and ecosystem across the world. This is where we wanted to build a very strong connect with the client. And that's why we uh, put, designed this as a cover page, for example. So every proposal, this is a very good practice that you can adopt, is that every proposal that you submit, make sure that the cover page is something that you can build as a, a good empathy with the client. Another example that which comes to my mind is, you know, a large pizza, com pizza company floated a lot, you know, you know, RFP for, for some kind of IT systems or solutions. And this IT company designed their entire proposal to look like that of a pizza box. Now, that's very creative and innovative, innovative right? You're building empathy with the client. You're building a, 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 a sort of a shared values with the client. And, and that goes a long way. Remember my statement, proposals are very boring to read. And what do we do? We take revenge on our clients and submit equally boring proposals. You can take that world out. You can you can submit very exciting, good-looking proposals, and that's what this is uh, uh, trying to illustrate. Uh, to talking about your differentiators right in the cover page. Remember, we arrived at those differentiators. You bring them out on the cover page itself. So those are some best practices that you can sort of hit up. Um, as you can see, so right from table of contents to uh, for example, uh, you know, the way we write executive summary, for example. So there are techniques on how to write good executive summaries. I'm not going into the details of it, but lots of stuff that you can do there. As you can see, our proposal also has this channel, a gray channel on the left. So you can see we use this to put in what I call as this graphics callouts to embellish our proposal quality and uh, maybe sometimes even summarize some level of text um, through uh, callouts like this. Sorry, I'll just, uh, yeah. So um, hopefully this gives you a sense of how uh, world-class proposals can look like, or this is our worldview. Um, and hopefully you are able to relate to it. So in this particular case, we are talking about how this particular section 
addresses this particular section or subsection of the client RFP. So we are referring to the RFP section or subsection and things like that. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, what this is all about. Um, great. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I'm just um, thinking a little aloud and Srinivas and maybe you can help me. There are two choices. I do have um, a presentation which I can walk through or alternatively, we can open up the forum for questions and uh, see how it goes because I'm, I'm a strong believer of interactions. Conversations is something which I really like. And I would be more than happy to do it. What do you I suggest, think, Master? No, I feel uh, if that uh, that life cycle, yeah, if you just give a walkthrough and then open it for questions. That would be um, okay. Okay, all right. So I'll quickly, quickly jump onto that. All right, fair enough. Okay. Um, yeah. So don't forget to put your questions into the chat box, um, and we'll try and address them. Okay. So I'm just going to share some more perspective on the world of work class proposals. So um, just, just to make sure that we all understand the definition of a proposal is a formal response to a requirement that offers a unique solution. That's really a key word here at a price scope timelines and how it will be delivered. The point is that unique solution is critical to every proposal and that's why you know, making sense of the RFP, doing that analysis, building that win strategy becomes very, very important. Otherwise, your proposal can look like that of a quotation. I'm sure you're all kind of familiar with quotation. Um, so there's a world of difference between quotations and proposals because in proposals, you're always building a unique solution. Also, some interesting research and background study. This was a study done by McKinsey and published in Harvard Business Review which is to say that when companies have strong pre-sales capabilities or strong capture planning capabilities, they tend to win 40 to 50% in new business and 80 to 90% in renewal business, which is a very, very strong um, uh, track record that you can build. The second important point is the fact that uh, your ability to close deals revolves around shaping conversations, which also goes back to the earlier point that we talked about, Srinivas, and about evaluation criteria. Suggesting an evaluation criteria, I call it a shaping the conversation. Because if the client does not has not thought about evaluation criteria, maybe you can shape the conversation and say, you know what, Mr. Client, let me come up with some suggested evaluation criteria. You take a look at it, the right to reject, right to adopt, right to amend it is completely yours. Basically, what you're doing is shaping the conversation, okay. right? So that's 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 what is is this research uh, kind of uh, confirming, and and I can say with hundred percent conviction based on my experience that both these statements are absolutely so true. So when it comes to the entire world of capture planning and business development and proposals and all of those, there are really only three metrics that count: win ratios. I submitted ten proposals. I won three. Win ratio is 30%. Capture ratios, the 10 proposals that I submitted was um, worth 100 crores. And out of that, I won 40 crores, let's say, for example. So my capture ratio is 40%. And the cost per bid is basically how much effort I'm expending per bid. Because at the end of the day, this is a fixed cost center, fixed resources, and all of those. You want to be always be also monitoring your cost. Uh, so two things which really goes into putting together world-class proposals, making sure the right content is there and presenting it effectively. Uh, the good news today, especially in India, is that the presenting effectively part of it is literally exploded. Uh, why is it exploded? That India today has no lack of talent in the area of graphics and visual design. I mean, I mean in um, Pune is where I live. And I know of at least three design schools which produce graphics and visual design professions yearly. And you have top-notch design schools like the National Institute of Design. You have IIT Mumbai offering a bachelor's degree now in design, master's degree in design. So this area is literally exploded and at extremely attractive costs. Okay, the Much, 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 much easier problem to solve. But creating the right content is the slightly more difficult uh, problem to solve. But um, 
organizations that focus on this very well also tend to win far more. So I think uh, doing that in case you are in that journey as part of your organization, then this is something which you cannot compromise on is what I would uh, strongly recommend. Um, so when it comes to proposal, there are really two elements into it. One, what's called as unique content, another what's called as boilerplate content. Unique content is what? Is something that you have to uniquely crafted, created for every proposal. You cannot shortcut this process. That means you have to analyze, think, put together the content uniquely for every proposal. Whereas boilerplate content are things that are more like supportive in nature. So many times client might say, you know, give us a couple of case studies of similar engagements that you've done with in the past, you know, give us some details. So those become case studies. Tell us how you do project management, for example. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll have very standard write-ups on that. All of these boilerplate content um, uh, becomes extremely useful. I keep giving this example of a restaurant. You know, so so let's say when you walk into a restaurant and you order a very simple dish. You know, let's say for example, you say, um, "I want a bowl of dal, but I want extra onions. I want less oil. I want uh, extra salt, um, and something like that." And most restaurants that you go to. Uh, typically will produce a dal in about 10 to 15 minutes. Now, the same thing, you try to attempt it uh, uh, in somebody's home. Let's say, you Allah, walk in, let's say you walk into your friend's Ma, home and tell him, hey, um, uh, hey, can you cook me a bowl Sorry. of dal? He's likely to take anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour because he literally has to start from scratch. So how does this work in a restaurant example? The le- restaurant keeps a lot of boilerplate content ready. So the dal is pre-cooked in the morning, the onions are cut, the chilies are cut. Um, all of those is readily available. As and when they get the order, they put that into a saucepan, mix it all together, less salt, more onions, more tomatoes, whatever is your customization requirement, which I call equivalent to unique content that they're still able to produce a, a hot, piping, tasty dal, right? To a degree, proposal effort is also there. The more organized you are, the more you will be able to focus on unique content. And that becomes where the winning happens. The winning happens here. The not losing out happens here. And that's something which you need to focus on. Right. Um, again, I've got, uh, this can be a very long uh, discussion on this slide, but I'm just going to quickly spend some time on this, is that you can broadly classify any opportunity into these three uh, categories, strategic, operational, and transactional. And uh, they may have very two different views depending on which side you are on. So a strategic buy for a client is infrequent, organization-wide impact, and high risk. But for your organization, it's high value, it's a stretch for your organization, highly customized response, and may require even partnering. Let me take you a very simple example of this in your life, let's say, right? I don't know how many of you have bought your own uh, flat or apartment or house, But chances are very high that that's a very strategic buy for us. Why is it strategic? Because it's very infrequent. Hopefully, you know, uh, unless you are a property tycoon, you're not going to buy, buy what, more than one or two two or maybe three houses in our lifetime, right? Uh, uh, Organization-wide impact in this case could be it's a lifetime of impact, right? If you have chosen your house, then it's going to have an impact for you for more or less your lifetime. Now, the, the choice of school, the suburb you're in, uh, you know, the kind of facilities you're looking for, safety, all of those are things that you will have to live with practically for a lifetime, right? And therefore, to that extent, there's also high risk. So you will find that, you know, that it's a very strategic buy for you. But if you look at it from the builder's standpoint, it's a very operational kind of sell for him. Right? So when you're talking to the builder or, or the property um, seller, um, you know, who, who's a large organization, uh, for example, they tend to treat it as very transactional. And many times, therefore, we kind of get this feeling that they don't treat us very well. Here you're saying, oh my God, I'm putting together my entire lifetime of savings into this. I want to make sure that I'm taking the right decision. And here is a builder who's not treating me right. Chances are very high that you might also do that with your clients when you think it's a very organization, operational type, type of opportunity, but to the clients, it's very strategic. So I just wanted to kind of 
illustrate this uh, different lines of thinking that you adopt and what your client does. And it's very important to be aware that what kind of thinking the client is going through in, in, in his or her mind. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the pillars of the entire capture planning pre-sales function is really the four things. People process content graphics. People, you need highly skilled people. You know, people with strong project management capabilities automatically become a very significant, if I may say, participants in the pre-sales role because of, because of their um, strong skills in planning, strategizing, resource management, time management, et cetera, et cetera. Need to bring in the whole attitude of winning. And that's something which you can learn through training. You can learn um, uh, to uh, work with sales, uh, you know, go go and read up some books and things of those nature and, and can certainly build those. Process, I kind of illustrated a process of how to analyze RFP, how to build win strategy. Hopefully that's given you a sense. I talked about boilerplate content, you know, keeping the onions cut, keeping the chilies cut. It's a similar sort of analogy in the world of capture planning is, is what I um, um, mean here. And graphics, I've kind of shown you what graphics can do to the quality of your proposals and illustrate that. Right. Um, with that, I think pretty much come to the end of my uh, presentation, just to quickly tell you what we do as an organization. So we are only in the area of capture planning, um, capture planning, pre-sale, bid and proposal management. That's exactly what we do. And we do it through three things. We do lots of training. We do lots of consulting. And of course, uh, we do proposal services. Um, so training, we have done, we have trained more than 1,000 people across organizations like Capgemini, SAP, Oracle, Tech Mahindra, um, uh, LNT, uh, transmission companies, um, uh, EPC type companies. So those are the kind of organizations that we have gone ahead and done training. Uh, consulting is where we work with organizations, look at their processes, look at their training, um, see how the processes can be improved, handhold them through a few proposals, then we kind of uh, typically come out. So this works more or less on a project kind of uh, basis. And then, of course, proposal services. Here we work with uh, clients and we actually become their partners. We develop proposals working with them, their sales, their solution specialists, all of those. We put together the proposal uh, end to end and make sure that the best quality, we bring in the graphics and visual design capabilities and make sure at the end of the day that the proposal is of uh, really high, high uh, class and quality. Um, that's my contact details. Um, but yeah, let me stop here. And uh, so I'm done, Srinivasan. Uh, so we can open up the forum for questions and uh, happy to sort of uh, address them. Okay, good. Uh, okay, okay, thank you so much. I think. Uh... Uh, your experience and the the four pillars and, and the best practices. Uh, I'm not sure for the uh, rest of the audience, but uh, personally, uh, it helped me a lot because I have been doing this job for the last 15 years, maybe more of an ad hoc basis, but I understood, okay, how it has to be. So, uh, yeah, it will be good. Uh, if you can share a PDF copy of this presentation, this one, I'm sure it will be useful to many of those who participated in that. So now with sure. this uh, few note, uh, I'll just open it to audience uh, who would like to ask any questions, uh, maybe based on your experience uh, in terms of proposal developments, winning these metrics and other things. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll just leave it to the uh, guests uh, who have joined, uh, Andrew, Jay, and many others. Uh, uh, yeah, please, uh, either you can chat or you can uh, unmute and you can ask, uh, please. So while we are waiting for questions, Shinivas, uh, do you think this whole uh, thing was relevant for the audience? They would have felt it uh, useful. I am sure. <laughs> uh, at least, uh, uh, like I have uh, three, four known BD guys in this group, uh, our okay. one very known colleagues. Sure. Uh, 
it, I, I mean, it's very important. No? They are making the first contact with the customer. Okay, so it decides. Okay, your first impressions of you do that. And uh, I have, uh, yeah, personally handled many such things. It, it makes a lot of difference. And we shouldn't ignore it. Actually, yes. I had a, one uh, uh, question. Sure. Uh, from your experience, uh, I can, the probability of success by just making an intuitive ad hoc proposal versus uh, a professionally structured proposal, what is the likelihood of uh, win? Assuming uh, the dev capability to deliver remains the same in both the cases. Sure. Okay. Sure. What kind of, uh, let's say we can comparison we make between ad hoc versus uh, uh, a well-trained, professionally managed uh, proposal? Sure. Um, world of difference. Mm. World of difference. Um, I have sub. I've, I myself have been a culprit of this. I myself have submitted um, proposals taking a very arrogant attitude, saying, "Hey, you know, client wants it. What's a big deal? We know it all. We have done it. You know, here is my standard proposal five, uh, which I submitted three months ago. Copy paste, change the client name, rehashed a few things, and submitted the proposal. And you know, a, many times is literally I've been punched in the face with that because um, um, B two B businesses by nature are complex, and even within the same industry, no two businesses are the same. Okay, and if you don't take the trouble to understand what the client is trying to solve, then um, you are taking an arrogant attitude and. Uh, whether your intention is to be arrogant or not, it doesn't matter, but it will, it starts showing up as you being arrogant. And typically, and I'm sure that applies to you, you and us as well, right? When you are buying individual things that you don't like people to be arrogant and very pushy on the other side to sell. We want to make the choice. You know, We want the choice to be kept with us as buyers. The same thing applies to B2B businesses as well. And that's where your your chances of winning something is going to be severely diminished. I can even give you an example, like when I was working in the US, we were uh, there was this large um, uh, mutual fund company called Fidelity Investment, which is probably one of the largest in the world, which has got typically about $1.8 trillion of assets under management. They were trying to migrate one of the legacy systems to a new platform. And we were a tier two company, you know, no brand name, no nothing. But uh, the brilliant job the team did, uh, our team did, was to come up with a very unique solution. We brought in a ex-city banker to participate as a subject matter expert. We designed a, designed a brilliant solution and that got reflected in our proposal. Our proposal was, our competition, just to give you some illustration, was IBM, Accenture, TCS, Infosys. And we were the only tier two player. All of them were tier one players. Our um, uh, uh, price uh, compared to the next best was at least 30% more. Our margin for that entire zone was about 80%. Gross margin was 80%. We had priced it so high. And in spite of all of this, the client gave us the deal. You know why? He said this was the most innovative proposal, number one. Number two, we still, we see some areas of weakness with you guys. But you know what? We will work with you to eliminate those weaknesses. Which client ever makes those statements? They went out of the way to get us on board because I believe we didn't demonstrate an arrogant attitude. We genuinely wanted to solve that uh, problem for them. And, and, and that kind of showed in, in the yeah, solution. Yeah. That yeah. Okay. There is a question from one of the participants. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, is this field, uh, uh, what is the scope for an entry level uh, graduate or management graduate? Oh, this is, this is such an exciting question. This is very close to my heart. So thanks, Joshua, for asking this, uh, this question. So what I'm doing as, uh, yeah, let me just bring in APMP here. So I also work with this association called uh, Association of Proposal Management Professionals. 
your project management guys, you know PMI. So for bid and proposal professionals, APMP is the equivalent of PMI. Simple answer. So I am on the governing board of APMP India. And what we have done here is that we have introduced a course called business proposal writing for both engineering schools and B schools. We have successfully rolled it out with an engineering institution called Vishwakarma Institute of Technology. People who are familiar with Pune uh, will recognize that this is a fairly good engineering school. We till date we have done 350 plus 150. Roughly about 400 students have passed out of this course. A new batch is starting. I personally have delivered this course at Goa Institute of Management three years. Um, 80, 80, 80, roughly about 240 students have passed out of this course. So to answer your question, Joshua, that um, while companies are still a little close-minded in getting entry-level, uh, opening up with entry-level jobs in this area, I can tell you for sure that institutes are now starting to look at. So if you know institutes or, or B schools or engineering schools who are open to this idea, we as APMP, now I'm wearing my APMP hat, we as part of APMP can provide you the entire course material, we can bring in the faculty, we can deliver the course, all of those we can do. We can make that initial presentation to the faculty or the students to talk about what this course means, what kind of career paths you have, um, things of those nature. So as you can see, I'm speaking, speaking with a lot of passion because this is very close to my heart. And uh, Joshua, if you want to get in touch with me also, I've put in my contact details, get in touch with me. We, can, we are more than happy to see how we can work with you or whoever else you can introduce us. This applies to you as well, Srinivasan. In case you yeah. come across any institutes who might be interested, we are more than happy to work with them to bring this out there. Yeah. Yeah. I think one idea for uh, okay, taking up this webinar is also uh, like... Uh, we work with a lot of clients and you work with a lot of clients. So when such we see uh, some kind of gaps, uh, we can uh, definitely kind of uh, recommend and then do uh, equip them okay, with your help in terms of uh, sure. improving. Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, see those uh, uh, who want to uh, leave early or something, please uh, uh, put your feedback, uh, uh, Prashant will paste the feedback link in the chat box. Uh, please uh, put your feedback and also you can express your interest uh, to learn more about the capture planning and certification in proposal uh, uh, kind of a development. Uh, so we can send you the link and more information about it. And we'll also pass it on uh, KK's uh, contact information uh, you can contact in terms of uh, taking up uh, their services or in terms of uh, knowing more about, uh, okay, in this arena. I, I personally uh, were convinced uh, that it is uh, very critical. I have seen, uh, okay, where uh, we gave uh, a good uh, solution perspective and how we can solve the problems and uh, uh, demonstrating our credibility. I've seen very clear winning uh, things. In fact, uh, one of our uh, uh, government, even uh, uh, they were in defense, uh, he said uh, uh, the way you gave uh, the course outline was so convincing that I could uh, okay, uh, have the confidence to give it to you, uh, you to do the some of the training aspects. So like that, okay, both the content in terms of presentation and especially a few things like what you said where you have this uh, boilerplate definitions uh, well laid out, you can use that time to make uh, uniqueness uh, in other content related. Yes. And also things like uh, cover page and uh, quoting cross references to RFQ uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, outline. I mean, those are my takeaways from this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm sure, uh, I mean, we will apply many things and also we will learn more about it. And uh, uh, so thank you, KK. Uh, we learned a lot. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Uh, I just don't want to talk only to you. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? If you have any questions, we have 10 more minutes. We can make use of it. 
and uh, yeah the yeah. um there was a, a message from andrew dowling he talked about we tend to be locked into using predefined template structures that is so true andrew um that the temptation to have predefined structures and proposals is extremely high um and to to some extent boilerplate content is that but moment you get into a situation that for every opportunity you throw boilerplate content as a response effectively you're taking a very templatized approach and moment you do that then client clients usually see through that very very quickly they saying hang on you're not taking the trouble to understand my world your response sounds more brochureish you know that's a language that many times they have used um, many times i've been the victim of that as well client told me hey your proposal looks like a brochure <laughs> so um uh, then i realized you know or, or the kind of mistakes that i made so so that's something andrew we we have to really watch out for remember the definition of proposal a unique solution and that requires uniqueness every time that you need to do it. support it of course by boilerplate content so but if you don't bring that thinking in the temptation to use boilerplate content and throw throw this in and um push it out as a proposal is extremely high and i mean why uh, this i i i literally give you my own example back in 1998 we had created a proposal for a for a company and one of the sales guys came and said you know what kk i need that proposal because i promise a proposal response to the client the very next day ridiculous timelines so i said how are you going to put together a proposal like that it's not don't worry i'm going to take that proposal change the name and put it in and this was the days of word star and all of those which i'm sure you know can you imagine you might appreciate that world but uh, what happened was in a few places the client names didn't get changed for for whatever reason and you were looking very they were looking very embarrassed in front of the client saying you know what what is this i mean this these terms don't look very familiar when when you do things like that so some crazy and uh, yet hilarious uh, examples of doing things like this have happened uh, do you uh, kind of give some kind of a one time support to create a, a boiler plate for a specific company uh, which of course the content the uniqueness uh, they can use it uh, so you can de- design some kind of a contextual cover page sure. and then give recommended sections subsections uh, and uh, other things so that uh, uh, the customer can use it as a template uh, for uh, different variants uh, do you provide such service if so yes how do you bill it uh, like for example uh, let's say per monday or uh, something if if that is kind of affordable for let's say an sme or something because they know uh the technology they know their maturity delivery but uh, this art of making proposal uh, do you provide as part of uh, one time service to some of the customers see if if it if if it is pure boilerplate uh, uh-huh. we we can do what is called as uh, your two options one is we can do what is called as boilerplate content transformation so what we do is that at a point in time whatever is your boilerplate content we can take it and completely transform it that means okay. write mm-hmm. better present better mm-hmm. do that enter exercise hand it back to you and we walk off so it's yeah. more like a project engagement correct but of course boilerplate content is never static it keeps changing over a yes, period yes, of time yes. you have to archive old stuff bring in correct. new stuff so that's the boilerplate content service that we can provide so okay. on an ongoing basis we can work with your organization to make sure that the boilerplate content is up to date the the second part is very highly ignored by most most organization why because it's very boring nobody got promoted doing boilerplate content so it typically tends to get ignored then suddenly somebody wakes up and say hey we are we are produce, producing junk in our proposal this whole thing needs to be transformed so there is this uh, you know sudden wake up time and then go to sleep for long periods of time sudden wake up time and go to sleep mm. boilerplate content is to work that way you have to be awake throughout and okay. make sure it keeps getting updated so both options are possible mm. one time uh, transformation or boilerplate content as a service uh, but um, where we think we can add significant value is 
putting together a proposal. So for example, you know, we work with a product software company based out of Mumbai. We started off with boilerplate content transformation. And, uh, but they soon realized that boilerplate content only transforms a proposal to a certain extent mm. because of the unique content uh, and boilerplate content that we talked about. So they said, can you help us in the unique content? And he said, they, we can. And so what we did is we brought in the processes, we trained their people, we brought in graphics and visual design, all of those that we brought in and work with them as a partner um, mm. uh, with their sales, their solution specialist. We have been engaged with them for four years. We are now about to uh, renew our contract for another two years. So, you know, that's a kind of deep relationships that we have with our clients. Because that's when we can add a lot of value, value. Uh, to our clients. Okay. Good. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, KK. This was uh, uh, very, very useful. And uh, I'm sure, okay, there will be more, okay, these kind of service requests if that comes up and we can uh, work on it and uh, yeah so we'll we'll keep in touch and then uh, thanks a lot sure. thanks a lot uh, sure. all colleagues uh, who have joined uh, uh, so thank you for so much for your time taking up and then do that kindly please uh, leave the feedback so that will help us help uh, uh, krishna kumar also in terms of uh, providing okay uh, how this session was and uh, thank you so much Yes. So, thank you, thank Srinivasan. You. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Again, yeah. please keep safe and uh, hopefully you have a nice weekend uh, coming forward. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, sir.